Our first talk is entitled Hitchhiker's Guide to the North Korean Malware Galaxy. And our speakers today are Christian Beek, who is formerly director of TI at McAfee Labs and director of IR at Finestone, currently a lead scientist and principal engineer in the office of the CTO at McAfee, and Jay Rosenberg of Intaser. Intaser, thank you. And uh, I don't have a bio for Jay, but I just met him and he seems really cool. Uh, <laughs> Also, I have to say, like, I'm pretty floored by the amount of good uh, intel that we've seen out of this company in the past three years since they started. And so uh, without further ado, let's take it away. All right, thank you. So good morning, everybody. Um, really happy to, uh, to be here today to, to get with Jay and uh, present uh, our research, which we have at least worked on the last four or five months, I think, at least. And four or five months, yeah. And the funny thing is it started actually on Twitter, where we just started to, to chat about something and I, I got familiar with the technology and also like the, the, the stuff we are doing around nation states. And at some point we had the discussion, right? Okay, we know for example that for sure that some of the North Korean malware families are, are connected, that, that they're sharing code. Um, so that was a fact. But is there more we can discover? And actually that's what spiked our research, which we will talk about today. So the agenda for today, um, well, we introduce ourselves a little bit uh, shortly. Uh, and honestly, you can talk about uh, adversarial attacks, but I think in this uh, particular case, it, it's good to know some, to have some context. So a little bit of history about North Korean and some context around why you would see some of the attacks happening or why this is happening. Uh, we highlight the cyber units, uh, then we dive into the code. Uh, no worries, we're not going assembly bit level too much. <laughs> uh, we give some practical example, like, okay, if you have this knowledge, how you can apply this. Uh, we have some final thoughts, and we have a really nice surprise for you guys as well, uh, which we will release at the end of this talk, so uh, more on that later. Okay. Okay, Jay. Um, so I'll introduce myself. I'm uh, the se Senior Security Researcher at Integer Labs. Uh, where we've applied the concepts of human biology to uh, software. Um, and I lead the research behind a technology that uh, we're able to find code reuse. Um, I'm sure, how many of you are developers or not a program? Most of you, I'm assuming. And we all know that programmers reuse code all the time. And this applies to nation state threat actors and companies like Microsoft. Uh, so, Christian, you want to? Sure. So I'm a senior principal engineer uh, and lead scientist in McAfee in the office of the CTO. And my team, we're really looking at kind of advanced threats in, in, in the broadest sense, like nation states, um, cyber criminals, and we closely work together with law enforcement to get these guys behind bars. And also what we learn from the nation state attacks, the tactic, techniques, the tactics they're using, can we detect this or do we have to innovate on new technologies and, um, and stuff like that? So that's in a nutshell uh, what I'm working on. So like I said, um, if we talk about North Korean, uh, it's a very interesting country, uh, I think myself. Like if you look at the history of the country, like after uh, the Second World War, they got split up between North and South. And it's very interesting to see what happens. Uh, like when they split up the countries, they never thought about the, the different resources. Like the resources they have like in the south, they don't have in the north. The north is a lot of like uh, mountains. Uh, so not many, the only thing they have is like coal. And th there's not a lot of th those resources which give them like trading opportunities with other countries to earn money. On top of that, they have a kind of culture where they want to do the things on their own. So really doing the things themselves, uh, don't ask for help. It's kind of the culture that lives in that country. So if you take that into the back of your head when you look at those cyber threats, attacks, you start to understand more why in some cases they start attacking uh, other nations or other services. Uh, especially if you talk, take about the, the second leader, Kim Jong-il, around that area, 2004, 2005. That's exactly actually the area where they started to look into cyber warfare. It started very slowly, easy with some basic DDoS tools, but more and more they start to adapt and learn and invest in that program. And of course, with the latest leader, 
uh, yeah, this continues like massively. Next slide, please. Uh, and also due to like all the sanctions and everything on North Korea, they've really evolved into more uh, financial crimes. And there was actually a great article um, about a uh, North Korean defector that was in one of the cyber units, and he said um, that they would do anything to bring money back to uh, North Korea. Yeah, uh, and that's also part of their really education program. So let's take the next slide, please. So how does it work? If you are identified in North Korea on like your elementary school to be really good at computers, you actually can go to number one, the gang one and two junior high school. And there it is where they identify the top talent and I would say the talent. If you're a top talent, you go to one of those universities where they really make you like a nation state hacker. If not, like Jay said, they have this program where they send you abroad and you have to bring back money for the country. So they get like a commercial target on their heads, like bring $100,000 a year uh, back to the country. You can keep 20,000 for yourself, for cost of living and earning, but the rest of the money is for the kingdom. So if you look at those particular operations, so that's where we see a lot of split in tools and, and malware is like, a lot of this, what I call junk, is really like, okay, um, cracking tools to crack uh, serial codes or they infect in the gambling world where they really try to um, get money from people that are gambling, gambling sites. Those kind of tiny operations or selling illegal software, that's particular for that group of people. If you look for the nation state ones, yeah, that, that's a whole different game. So if you look at their several uh, cyber units, and this is after the reorganization in 2013, they had like a one major big department but they started to reorganize that. And this is all Intel based on what we got from defectors and reports that were brought out by people uh, working and living in the country. So these are actually the several main units, I would say that there's some, maybe some few others, but uh, if you look nowadays, um, yeah, the units we, we deal mostly with is unit 91. Uh, they do more the espionage kind of operations, looking for knowledge, like, hey, what is happening here? Or what is this company doing? What is the strategy of this country? What is their opinion about uh, some political uh, standpoints? Um, unit 110, actually, that's the tool development de uh, unit. So they develop actually all the kind of tools being used in nation state attacks. And um, I want to highlight one more, if you look like, last couple of years, I would say uh, unit 180. If we talk about the swift banking attacks all over the world, this is the unit that's actually uh, doing all these attacks. And of course, like Jay mentioned as well, like we, we saw the sanctions happening, uh, I think last year around May, 2017 May, uh, the US put sanctions on uh, North Korea. And of course they had to gain money. So immediately we saw a ramp up on uh, attacks on cryptocurrency exchanges around the world. Uh, firstly focused on South Korea, but we have evidence that we saw more uh, attacks happening over there. And this is actually very unusual for nation states to do. They're usually interested more in cyber es espionage or cyber warfare instead of financial gain. Um, so this is pretty unique to North Korea. So honestly, to be a nation state hacker in North Korea is very beneficial. There's, there's some nice benefits for you, if you can call it like that, of course. Who doesn't want to be lifelong party membership? Who doesn't want to have access to the nice uh, air-conditioned limousine bus in the city? But also, they get the luxury apartments, uh, internet access, which is of course very rare if you, uh, if, you, if you live in North Korea. But also, if you do your job well, you get a nice bonus. And in many cases, uh, you're allowed to travel abroad. Most of these guys, they finish their study up in North Korea and they be, will be sent out to some countries in the world where they do like a computer science degree. Sometimes they stay over there operating in cells, but also many times they actually go back uh, to North Korea and coordinate the attacks from different uh, units over there. So this is in a nutshell like the benefits of 
being a North Korean state sh nation state hacker? Um, so, uh, uh, Christian and I conducted, we, we took a lot of samples of, um, of North Korean malware uh, dating back from 2007 until the present. Uh, and we checked the code similarity between all of these samples. So this is what we mean by let the code speak. Um, here is a timeline of different uh, cyber campaigns and uh, malware tool sets used by North Korea. Um, like you can see the wiper MyDoom um, in 2009, uh, which actually has links to the WannaCry attack in 2017. Um, okay, go put one more back. Oh, and and also to keep put this in perspective, like if you do the research like we did, you want to be absolutely sure that your base set of samples is correct. So what we did is actually we took samples from the campaigns that we were absolutely sure and confirmed by multiple vendors that these were North Korean attacks. So that we started with this base set and actually. While doing the research, we were building on top of this and getting more and more uh, data to our research. So. so, in particular, a lot of times when you look at kind of nation state attacks, uh, people tend to see only the IOCs or TDPs, right? It's like a like kind of flat diagram where we look at, but actually, when I train my analysts around investigations and um, research about these particular campaigns. I, I, I like to use this diagram. Is it, is it the law? No. Uh, are there variations? Absolutely. But typically, we tend to use to, to, to look at TDPs, we look at the strings, uh, maybe some file artifacts, and that's it, right? But also important, in my opinion, now we have the ability of like code reusage uh, analysis but also like the history. Is there any history or context? That's the major keyword in, in, for my research is what is the context of this campaign or where does this malware fit in? And of course, the, the last one, if you, if you wonder what is SIF, stuff I forgot. So <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the, there are multiple ways of looking at some of the campaigns and I, I like to challenge people because uh, nowadays I see a trend where a lot of people are like, oh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, that, that's the answer, right? I think it's a tool, it, it will help us. But I think especially in these kind of cases, human intelligence is key. We have analysts in our team, including myself, that are six, seven years focused on certain nations. That knowledge, that experience can't be replaced by any machine. And that's why I really try to challenge always my people when we do the research, like look in multiple dimensions to what you're seeing. Because you might looking only at the assembly code in IDA Pro, but what is the story? I think that's what the key question I always ask, what is the story here? And I think that's the same what we did in our research, like what is the story here? Because we can see that there's a code reusage being done, but what is it? When we had some false positives, right? We have some funny stories. Yes, there. We, we did have some false positives. And uh, there was actually like a South Korean, um, uh, it was kind of like, um, how do you say? Uh, false flag. Like, oh, uh, onion dog. It was, it's called onion dog. And it was kind of uh, done by the South Korean government. And then it kind of spread outside. And it did share some code with uh, North Korean malware. Um, but this was a false... Yeah, false yeah it was like a, a South Korean cyber warfare exercise. Yes. So they did like a cyber warfare exercise in the country. It got leaked out. People started to upload it to VirusTotal. And then suddenly, because of some of the artifacts, yeah, it seemed like it was North Korean. But again, looking at the context, where did it came from, poking around a little bit more, yeah, we found out false flag. <laughs> so you can't just look at like one... Um, piece like the code or the strings or you need to know the whole context and all the dimensions involved. Uh. So this is the question I always ask as well. Why on earth makes this sense? Famous example, Olympic destroyer. During the Olympic Winter Games, uh, there was like an attack on the uh, Olympic Committee and all their systems. 
to be shut down. And the first thing we had some vendors shouting out, oh, it's North Korea. And I was like, with all respect, they just had a kind of agreement where they send in their, their teams. So we had like at athletes um, participating in the winter games. He sent his sister over to, to be with the opening ceremony. So why on earth would you then disrupt the systems during the opening ceremony? It doesn't make sense, right? Just common sense. And finally, after a few months with some more research from different parties, yeah, there was another actor popping up. So always like this as well, why did it make sense? Well, there was the gold dragon. Yeah. There, were m there were multiple <coughs> different types of malware going around uh, during the Olympics. And uh, McAfee did a report on gold dragon, which is uh, one of North Korean, uh, in the North Korean malware tool set. Um, uh, at Intizer, actually, we wrote a report. Uh, we had evidence of Chinese code reuse, but we said this is not substantial and this is just evidence pointing towards China. Um, so. yep. I, I think we released our research, our, our paper around uh, Black Hat this year, DEF CON. Uh, I think we had tons of interviews with journalists, and I think the biggest question we always got like was, how sure are you this might be North Korean stuff? Because honestly, if you're very skilled, uh, of course I can write a piece of malware that might look like it's coming from North Korea. And, and like I said, with all the dimensions we researched in our um, investigation, we were pretty sure, but I just wanted to give you an example here. Um, three different samples, all three used in um, an attack on the SWIFT banking systems. 2016, 17, 18. As you can see, there are all Russian words in there, like command control, stuff like that. The funny thing is, and of course we have Russian people, Russian speaking people in our team, they were laughing at this because they said like, no, this is not correct. This is like the Google Translate of some of these words. So literally, the adversary put in command and control, Google Translate to Russian, and boom, you have this word. But then, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, when you did like the <coughs> rich PE header analysis of all three tools, you could actually see all three were developed in the same dev environment. So it was like a certain Visual Studio um, uh, version they used for developing all three samples. So again, false flags, but then if you go deeper, look at the context and where it came from, and in the line of, okay, who would benefit from these attacks? Yeah, easy, no brainer, North Korea. Um, so this was uh, the final result of the different uh, malware campaigns and uh, malware tools used by North Korea, showing a graph of the connections of, of the code reuse of each of these families and um, binaries in each campaign. Uh, and you'll, at the end, you'll see, you'll get something very cool uh, that we did where you'll actually be able to see these uh, connections, um, the specific code that connects all of these. And something you can um, see here is that there's two different clusters of uh, the, the malware, and this can signify that like a, lo a lot of these malware in the, the big cluster have been attributed to Lazarus, uh, which is in one of the groups operating within North Korea. And on the bottom, there's a cluster of three different malware, which uh, are thought to be affiliated with group one, two, three, another group within North Korea. So you can see there's, a, uh, there's no code connections between the different groups. And as it is, as I said before, um, programmers reuse code, so the people operating in this group were reusing a lot of the same code, and the same applied to group one, two, three. Can you explain me some more about why some of the red lines are thicker than the other ones? Uh, so the, the thickness of the line signifies the amount of code uh, that was reused, and when I, when I say code that's reused, it's not, um, we're talking about unique code, so uh, compilers generate code, uh, there's often common libraries and other things. 
these things are filtered, all of this is filtered out, and this is like the unique code specific to these malware families. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and sometimes we found some false p positives as well because we thought we found something unique, but then it's like, oh, wait a minute, they're using a kind of Chinese simplified language library in their malware, which we don't find here in the West. So that was not unique, so we had to filter out those results as well. Uh, I think one of the interesting things here as well is, of course, uh, and of course you don't want to mention WannaCry again in, in your <laughs> presentation. But to be honest, we found traces uh, for in WannaCry code that went back to 2009. 2009, the 2009. My Doom attack. So they reused code from 2009 back into their WannaCry malware uh, from last year. And actually, um, so with WannaCry, as I was saying about the libraries before, uh, well, it turns out uh, North Korea and Iran like to use Code Project for um, taking some code. So there's a library they both use. So there's actually like a small code overlap of. Uh, library that you can download right off code project. So, um, interesting fact. Uh, yep, just wait before you click for, it starts running. So, of course we did the Hitchhiker's Guide to the North Korean malware, right, Galaxy. And when I have to go through like thousands of samples sometimes in my day job, um, it's for me impossible to go through all those lines. I hate it. And of course, uh, since I'm in innovation, I, I love to think further beyond what we're going to do in the next couple of years. I thought like, you know what? How cool would it be if I can actually travel through my malware code? Because what I want to lo look for is like, what are the unique genes or DNA profiles of the malware? And if I have those bits, I can actually write detection or I can use this hunting. So I didn't have my Oculus Go with me, but actually at home I have this, this thing on my head and actually I'm traveling, uh, I'm traveling like this through my data. So this is actually me traveling through, through some of my malware family investigations. And so every one is actually a different malware that, that's some ransomware. And we're going to zoom in on some Korean stuff there in the bottom for a bit. But this is actually how I surf through my malware. And as you can see over here, it will stop in a moment. So we have like different families here with different artifacts. <laughs> And in the middle, you see the cross sections. And those cross sections are the unique DNA strings, or how you want to use it, uh, call it, that identifies all of them. So if I can write detection for those ones, actually I can detect or kill all those five. And the art is to find the weak spot where you can say like, it doesn't matter which version they create next, as long as these artifacts are there, I can kill it. Uh, that brings us to our next slide, which is uh, this is unique code. Um, it, if you're familiar with Ida Pro, this is disassembled. Um, it's an assembly. Um, this is unique code that was shared between the 2009 DDoS attacks uh, of MyDoom. Uh, that was also available in the 2017 WannaCry attack. Um, now, being able to hone in on such small pieces of code that are, that are unique like this, uh, maybe we would have been able to detect WannaCry better by looking at the code reuse. Um, the, same, uh, the same applies to here. Uh, this is a common file mapping function uh, that has only been seen in uh, Navrat and the North Korean um, gambling attack malware. Um, next, uh, we have a uh, uh, Sierra Bravo, which is one of the tools uh, mentioned by Noveta in their Blockbuster campaign report, and a core DLL bot that uh, creates a net share. And again, when I'm talking about unique code, this has only been seen in uh, both these malware families. Uh, next, um, in Dark Soul and the recent reports on Fall Chill, uh, here we have a unique file copy. I tried to use uh, code snippets that had strings in them to make it a little easier to visualize. Um, again, only seen in these two uh, North Korean malware families. Um, 
and then uh, this this function kept reappearing in a lot of the blockbuster uh, malware. Um, it modifies the access control list of an object to uh, everyone, the group. Um, and okay. So when you see all this research, right, and I just give a little teaser away already, is it, it's great, right? But what can you do with it? How can I make this actionable? So let's give some examples. Next slide, please. Okay. <laughs> So, I'm a big fan of the MITRE attack model. Is it the holy grail? No, absolutely not. But if you're familiar with the uh, Lockheed Martin's cyber kill chain, this is a more detailed part of the, the cyber kill chain. And the next iteration from MITRE's attack model, they will e even go a level deeper. So for example, if you talk about um, process injection, they describe the technique now, what it is but the next will be like really code examples of what the code injection will be. So if you look at um, the MITRE attack model, and this is just like a subset, so this is really the techniques that we saw in most of the North Korean uh, malware samples. This is what they're using. So these are the kind of defense evasion techniques, credential access techniques they're using. So if you have this knowledge, there are different ways to look at this. So for my SOC, CISO perspective, you can say like, okay, if I see these kind of techniques being used, what is my visibility? So what tools or what technology will give me the insights, the visibility to detect these kind of attacks? That's one. Or at the same time, where do I have my gaps, right? If I have some of them that I can actually put a sticker on like, okay, probably with these technologies, I have visibility in these areas, but where do I have my gaps and what would be best to address this? The other one as well is like, okay, hunting. Because if I know what kind of tools or um, techniques they are using, is there a way I can actually create rules or detection mechanisms to find out if this is happening? Another thing is like if you know the kind of behaviors these groups are doing, and then you're going to more into kind of a risk approach. Like, hey, am I on the target list of um, North Korea? As a financial institute, yeah, might be. And then you can ask yourself like, okay, if I see some of these techniques popping up in my logs or whatever you have visibility, what might be their next steps? So based on the history, based on what we know about previous attacks, what might be their next steps and which technology in my company would help me to block or detect the next steps. Different ways of actually how you can apply the MITRE model. So in our case, um, so if you, if you look for example um, more deeper in this knowledge, you have several campaigns, right? And if you map them out to some of the techniques, so you go to execution, credential access dumping, all these techniques. And then you look at the input data. So there must be a command prompt with commands, executables. Uh, we have run locations. You have arguments. Um, there's some PowerShell execution. This really tells you a story where you can act upon. And this is what we, in, in my team, do a lot when we look at campaigns is what is, again, what is the story? What is the techniques being used? And is there an overlap? Because if I know where the overlap is and then they really go into like the operating system level, then I know where I need to focus. Is it in, in, in memory? Is it maybe in the process inject, process manipulate area? Those are areas where I can focus then. Yes. So the question then is, which code can be used to create an actor DNA profile? So you saw me, of course, as a kind of gimmick surfing through the code in the galaxy. But I was also looking at, okay, where is the overlap? And if I have this overlap, can we create detection mechanisms to actually look for hunting? So you can create Java rules, which we'll Jay, uh, discuss in more depth and detail after this one, but other triggers as well. 
because I really want to find out what might be their next campaign, or can I stop them from the current and previous campaigns? Um, so this is actually uh, one of the Lazarus Group's signature uh, tactics, is to, they created like a fake TLS profile uh, protocol, um, where you can see like at the top, the wetransfer.com is the server name identification, um, but it actually connects to a different uh, CNC. Um, Christian, would you like to? Yeah, yeah and, and also we see this, this kind of tactic, like uh, the, the fake TLS pro, uh, mimicking. We see it a lot. Like many, many times we see that they are pretending that they are using a, a TLS, but it's completely fake. It's really one of their signatures, what we find through multiple families as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, what can you do with, like, for example, those uh, code, small pieces of code uh, that we're showing you before that were shared between the different uh, North Korean malware families? Um, well, a lot of people tend to build YAR rules off strings now. You add a little string obfuscation or something small like that, and uh, the YAR rules stop working. Um, if you're familiar with Kostin from uh, Kaspersky, he actually goes around making a talk called Attribution 2.0, and he talks about using opcodes, um, like the actual code, in order to build YAR rules. So in order to, to um, being able to hone in on such small amounts of code that are unique to these specific malware families, you can find these overlaps and you can build the YAR rules based off the opcodes of the assembly instructions. Um, now you see like in, in these rules over here, you see like a lot of wild cards um, because when, when we build rules, we take into account of maybe the uh, registers are being changed, uh, uh, Maybe um, you know ad addresses change um, in a different binary, so you have to take into account anything that could uh, change depending on maybe they use a different version of a compiler or, or whatnot. Um, so, like th this is the we found to be like the better method of building uh, YAR rules off the actual code itself and not just uh, strings you may find in a binary. Yeah, and I think uh, we, we, we th tested this truly, like creating those rules in opcode, and um, I would say there, there's hardly any false positive. If you, if you really, but the research before to find that unique piece, that's taking a lot of time, but the moment you, you have it, and actually you can create it, of course it takes time to build a YAR rule like this, uh, because you definitely have to look into like, the Intel CPUs, manuals, or okay, the registers, and the, 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 like, okay, what is the code for a jump? How to write that opcode here? What, what is the number? Okay, what is the wildcard here? So it takes a little bit of time, but once you manage to get the experience, of course, uh, it's really powerful. And um, we use this all the time as well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, uh, we've been able to find uh, a lot of new threats um, just from putting signatures like this up on VirusTotal. And the real thing is that the, at the end of the day, the code doesn't lie. Um, as I said before, strings can be encrypted and all that stuff, but the code, it remains the same and it's reused all the time. And, and, and also, if, um, like, like Jay, and I completely forgot to mention that on the slide with, uh, with all the lines and the, 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 the thick red lines, not only the, um, the relationships between the malware families uh, were there, and you showed a little example of like the different units, like a, a cyber unit or one, two, three or something, what you said. But also if you zoomed in more, we could definitely say like, okay, this is unit 180 doing uh, the financial tax, <coughs> but also they were supported by the other unit because you saw the exchange between the tooling. So what started with like a small subset of data which we know for sure, we, we opened up not only the campaign relationships, but also the unit relationships. And in some cases we found even campaigns that were unknown to be attributed or to anyone else. And we found like, hey, wait a minute, th there's more to the story thanks to the data. So that was really great. Mm -hmm. 
So, we're a bit fast, I think, today, but uh, uh. So some final thoughts here is that, um, well, as I mentioned, the analysis reveals for us like really, really interesting links, things that we wouldn't have seen before. And, it was and actually, we took North Korea as an example because we knew for sure they were exchanging code. But we definitely want to take this to the next level and the next steps where we want to investigate more and in broader data sets to see where we can find more link. Because we know, of course, that cyber criminals are exchanging code, right? Or do code for usage. If you look, for example, at currently Gantt Grab, uh, these guys using like a Visual Studio uh, um, de dev uh, kit uh, source code, and almost every week they have a new version. Um, every time the, the code is 80% equal, they just change a few bits. I think the last version had an, a little exploit in it that they added, but that's it. So that they're reusing it, yes. But I think it's really powerful to see, are there more links? Are there more things we can reveal by adding also more data? Yeah, that, that even applies to like um, banking trojans like Emotet. Um, it does come packed, but we have, there are two uh, significant, very small pieces of code that even in the, that you could tell just by the packer, but once the uh, actual payload gets unpacked itself, uh, 99, 98 to 99% of the binary is actually the same and hasn't changed. Um. And I think that the, the most of these points we have addressed well today, but pay attention to the details, right? Like, look at what you're seeing. Uh, <laughs> that famous example which we mentioned, right? Where we thought like, oh, wait a minute, we found a connection between uh, certain nation states. Well, it turned out to be like a sh shared library you can download from GitHub. Doesn't make sense, right? So you have to do your homework. But also like the Chinese simplified language libraries you find in some of these malware samples. Yeah, of course we don't have them here in, in, the, in the West because they're not part of maybe the dev studio they're using. So you need to be still sharp on when you do the analysis. And so you know, there's, there's like also like the compiler edit code and uh, as Christian said, like the overlaps in different libraries and whatnot, um, or even like open source rats like Ghostrat or something like that, where they, or Pony or Zeus, where they uh, tend to share code with, with these. All right, shall we do the drum, drum rolls for the announcement? <laughs> All right, there it is. Uh, yeah, you, you, want, you want to walk them through? Oh, sure. So um, we just wanted to announce this one, uh, fresh, just released, live, uh, all yours. So this is a, uh, with, with the research, this is a new release that we were releasing at uh, Blue Hat. Um, so this is um, a timeline with a lot of the North Korean malware families and attacks uh, in which you can, s you can actually go in and see maybe like the code reuse for each one. Uh, let's just do WannaCry because that's the, st you want to do something? Oh. <laughs> uh, maybe let's check uh, my doom. <coughs> so we can see like, uh, well this got unpacked, let's see. So my doom was uh, uh, an attack in 2009. Uh, there was a DDoS attack and also they added a wiper component. So we can see like the uh, related samples that are also in the MyDoom family and their actual shared unique code. Um, and then if you look, we can see related samples to other uh, Lazarus malware families. Like we see a lot to Sierra Bravo. Um, we can go check out another Um, another family. Uh, oh, grab Destover. Destover, yeah. It's the wiper being used in the Sony attacks. Um, and we can see that actually, so the Dest, we've, we've categorized like Destover under Lazarus in order, so we don't have uh, lots of results on code overlaps, but you can see inside which families it actually overlaps with. Um, so it actually shares 78% of its code with WannaCry. Uh, and this is an attack from 2014. 
um, that if had been uh, looked at the the smaller pieces of code, uh, maybe we could have had better prevention for like the WannaCry attack. Um, and we can see the even the shared code inside. This looks like some crypto. Um, but uh, we invite you to go on, and we have like a dedicated uh, web page that you can actually check out all the code relations of the samples that we used in our uh, comprehensive research. So, okay, let's go back to the presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next slide. So this is the link. So if you want to make a picture or take notes, uh, we'll keep it up for a minute. Um, and in the same time, um, this was our presentation. Uh, so let's open up the room for Q&A. And there are people with microphones, so I see. <laughs> Hello. So um, I'm I'm sure that uh, nation states um, will obtain you know weaponized malware from other nation states and try to do false flag operations from it. But have you been able to correlate evolutions in one nation state's TTPs because they've been learning from another nation state? Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. You see that. Uh, honestly, I, I see it on a daily basis, like where you see like where somebody's leaked out cyber weapon is soon being adapted by another nation. So techniques are being used, definitely. Uh, also keep in mind, uh, especially I know from, from an example from, if you, we talk about North Korea today here, um, we saw that a security researcher released a tool on December 20th. I know, I know the date exactly because I saw that. And within less than a week, that tool was adapted in one of their campaigns. So. It tells a story, right, again. Like if you are able to see a tool, test it, and work it out and implement it in a campaign in less than a week, uh, for me that's impressive. Um, <laughs> not, many, not many dev teams are able to do that. <laughs> so um, it, it tells you about the capacity. And also if you look at, for example, North Korea, but also Iran, like where they started and where they are now, it's interesting to see how these nations develop their cyber offensive capacity. And I think that that's, that's definitely um, uh, yeah, an area of interest. Awesome. Yeah. Um, got a two part kind of question to this. Can you guys hear me? Test one, two? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we are. I can't hear myself. Um, so, question for you on the uh, uh, similar related to that. Um, do you find that when when we publish results like this, um, that you that the criminals then would go and use, say, your website to grab those examples, or you know, use the signatures or somebody else, like you were saying with the the language difference? But now we're giving them the exact code. I mean, obviously they could probably dissect the same things that you guys are decompiling and whatnot. But do you find that we're kind of fighting an uphill battle by publishing our our findings and the signatures and the things we use to identify them, that it gives them more tools to kind of hide or, um, or adds to their tool set? Th there's always a balance between when you publish yes or no, right? And I know, for example, uh, uh, for Jay and, and their company is different, but um, because they're really focused on the technology. But if you look at, sorry, traditional uh, co company as, as like us, we always uh, inform or actually reach out to law enforcement to say like, hey, we found this operation, do we interfere with an ongoing investigation? And always feel like, hey, this is what we want to publish. Are you okay with it? And we don't want to give away too much. Like, we, we, you want to inform the customers and let you protect them. And on the other hand, you don't want to tip off too much around like what you found. So that's always a balance uh, that we need to find and what we need to discuss in our teams. So. You have a question? Right oh, another one. Yeah, hi. Um, or, so or organizations using your, your service and your uh, data around uh, uh, code reuse, have they been able to use that information to uh, make a case for attribution 
against a particular actor and take that information to a law enforcement agency to successfully go after a particular actor? Um, well, I can tell, like, from uh, one of our clients, actually, uh, they were able to generate, uh, they got sent a, a file. Um, they uploaded it to our system. They saw they found some code connections to, an, to a known malware. Um, and they were able to, like, generate YAR rules directly from, like, the unique code uh, to the specific malware, and then they searched it across uh, all the computers running in their network, and they were able to easily find um, other computers that had been infected with this, this known malware. Uh, is that? But, uh, but also to your point, um, yes, but, but I see it as a part of my toolkit. So it's not like, like, like a couple of times I hammered in like it's about context. So this is one part of the evidence, but also you need to look at what is the other evidence I have. And indeed, by using this, I have a stronger way of putting the similarities together. And then uh, combined with the other TDPs or evidence we have, or maybe law enforcement may have, because that happens a lot, right? They have evidence and we have the experience. Because they are law enforcement people good in actually uh, uh, like banging down doors with a SWAT team. <laughs> grabbing computers, mm -hmm. but, but we are investigating like malware and threats for years. So combining that knowledge, that, that private um, and government relationships, I think it's very successful. L last year, for example, we did a, um, uh, a SWAT team uh, <laughs> in, in Romania where we arrested a gang of uh, ransomware actors, thanks to the research of both. Like law enforcement had evidence, but we had also evidence. We combined it and then we could actually find who's behind it, and we arrested the guys. So we were, pretty, we we're getting more and more successful in those areas. Yeah. It, it comes a lot down to like uh, what Christian was talking about, about the different dimensions and the whole context of everything, like from the code uh, to the artifacts. And yeah. uh, Thank you. There was a question there. I, I wanted to ask about the, um, the visual, visualization tool you had. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah. Um, the visual visualization tool you had, where you're you know, flying through the galaxy, pretty neat, by the way. Um, is that like a released product you have? And no. also, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, also, like, what were we looking at? What were the nodes and what were the edges? I wasn't sure what I was looking at. Yeah. So um, it, it's about code. Like the, the the code, like like blocks of code are identified. Like for for example, network, uh, some registry values, PDB paths, stuff like that. And believe me, it's like 20 million uh, samples in my collection for doing that. So <laughs> that's a big one. Any more questions? Oh, there's one in the back. Yeah. So uh, the finding that you had in terms of identifying the common course that has been used, is it uh, a release to open source community so that they can take that your finding and probably build their own detection a mechanism or maybe machine learning so that they can identify if those are running into their environment. The so uh, I already asked that question. So detection mechanism that you are applying uh, b based on the finding that what common code or patterns are in use in all these attack tracks. Yeah. Is it uh, available on open source community so that you know others can take it and then you know start building their detection or their machine learning mechanism to identify those? So in our case, it's, uh, we're used mostly for hunting at the moment, but yeah, definitely you can, you can apply this at some point for a machine learning case. Totally agree. Uh, you guys you have a community you, version. Yes, right? so there is a community version. So like if you go on that timeline and you're interested in uh, North Korean malware, um, you can go there and you can actually see the unique code and build Yara rules off them and maybe integrate it into one of your security products. Uh, so you could potentially defend against future attacks from North Korea. And there was another question in the middle here? Or? Yeah, another here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, quick question on um, what we saw today, uh, North Korea specific. Would you say that the majority of it applies to other nation states in terms of identifying hackers early on and providing them extra benefits and the tactics that they use? Uh, no. Is that they're similar or different? No, 
I think North Korea is pretty unique on like doing the financial attacks. But it's pretty unique uh, characteristics. If you look at other nation states, uh, it's more like, like, like Jay also said, like the classic cyber espionage warfare you're seeing. It's like, it's like or it's used as making a statement, like, hey, uh, we're not, we, we don't agree with what's going on in the region. Let's make a statement. Or they're, they're using it like in different ways, and and then also the uh, the, the code reusage is less. Uh, well, I've actually. Um whether it's you're looking at like the Turla group or even the CIA, if you take Longhorn or like the Lamberts, uh, you actually do find maybe not like a higher percentage of similarity like you would with Lazarus. I mean, a lot of the, t or North Korea, a lot of the time with North Korean malware, you get like a 40 or 50% code similarity. But even, you know, you take Turla, you could find maybe 8% of the code has been reused in, in Turla. Or I've seen it with uh, CIA malware and uh, definitely Chinese malware. They just seem to rehash the same tools over and over again with a lot of the Chinese APT groups. Thank you. You're welcome. So if there's no more questions, then I really like to thank you for being here and for the people that are watching. And uh, oh, so there's one more. Oh, sorry. Hi, my name is Christian. Thanks for the talk. Awesome over overview. overview. Uh, one question about the Yara rule. Uh, as I understood, you were orienting on, on opcode patterns. So in this respect, aren't there any issues with runtime compression in future examples or samples? You mean like compila certain different compilation flags? And yeah, for example, yeah. Um, well, there, there can be. Um, we try to, like what we have is what we call genes, but we do some type of normalization to the actual assembly code. Um, and it's, you can, the, the closest you can get is by using like the wild cards for maybe things that are like uh, registers that might change and memory addresses that might change. Um, it's very hard to build like a, uh, the error rule that would also take into account like the uh, calling conventions of a function. Okay, thanks. There's one more question in the middle. Uh, we have 30 seconds, so I'm not sh sure how. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. All right. Thank you. Thank everybody. you very much.